here we have a Smith's Ingersoll pin palette pocket watch. These were made between 1948 and 1980. Ingersoll left the Alliance somewhere in the mid 1960s, so this is one of the earlier ones. They're always badged Ingersoll Triumph if they're from the Ingersoll brand and Smith's Empire if they're from the Smith's brand. They're also sold by other firms such as services. Now the glass on this one is loose. This is because the, the original material is celluloid and celluloid shrinks with time. It's got a yellow colour which also happens to celluloid um, but it's got a good low profile and um, it suits the watch. So what I'll do is I'll re-glue re the, the crystal when I finish servicing the watch. Now since the front of the watch is now bare I can remove the hands and the hands are radium hands so we have to be careful not to get any dust from them and uh, I think I can see some dust around there already so I think what I might do at this point is just use a little bit of a little bit of Rodico just to nip round and uh, remove any loose dust because I don't want to be eating any radium dust. There we go. So, just going to nip around the dial, mopping up any loose material. I'm just going to move the hands. Now this is pushed to set. In other words, you have to push the crown in in order to set the hands. And if you don't push the crown in, you're in permanent winding mode. So there we are. This particular design of movement dates from 1904 and it's an Ingersoll design. So when Ingersoll and Smiths built their combined factory in South Wales, they bought the design with them and it's pretty much unchanged since 1904. It works very well. It's, um, it's a, a basic functional watch and it keeps time to within about two minutes a day normally. I'm going to throw that Rodica away. Now I'm going to have a go at removing the hands. Now the hands on these watches are very, very tight. And very often they will fly across the room. When I use the hand levers, I tend to put my finger on top so that with the, uh, when the hands jump, they don't go across the room. This is just a polythene sheet and it helps to protect the dial. So there we go. So the hands will pop off with considerable violence in my experience, but I put my finger on top and they didn't go anywhere. So there we are. The second hand comes off very much more easily. Now I've removed the hands, I'm going to put them somewhere safe so that the radium on them isn't going to be a hazard to anybody. The paint on this is quite firm, it's not in a friable state. Now I can concentrate on taking the movement out of the case. Unlike some pin palette watches, it has no visible click. The click is inside. So what I need to do is first of all let the mainspring down. And in order to do this, I take the pressure off the mainspring using the, off the click rather, using the winding crown. And I've got to hold back the click, which is in there. And now I can let that run through my fingers. And there's the mainspring fully run down. That's good. And now I'm relatively safe to take the movement out of the case. So I'm now going to remove the four screws that hold on the movement to the case. Right, so all four screws should be out by now. There we are. Hopefully the movement will come out through the back. Let's have a little push. There it is. No problem with that. So I'll put the case on one side. Now you'll find the dial is held by four tabs. And it's only necessary to bend two of them because the other two will unhook from the other side. So I'm just going to choose the two which look as though they're most firmly on. That one there looks fairly firm. Then we lift them with a flat blade or even a hand lifting lever, anything which can get underneath them just to bend them up. So there's one done. Being careful of the balance here. There's another. At this point you often find the dial would just unhook from the other side by pushing it across. That's how we go. Sometimes you need to unbend a third one in order to clear the centre. But there it is, the dial is off.
So by only bending two of the tabs, I've only got to bend two of them back when I replace the dial later on. Under the dial we can see the motion work which come, just lifts off. This is riveted on, I can't remove that. The original pin pallet design didn't have a centre wheel. It had a very large mainspring and the centre wheel was put to one side. But this one, in order to have a subsidiary seconds hand, it's got a conventional layout. It's a tiny bit of power left on but nothing significant. This wasn't ticking at all, even though it was almost fully wound. And it's simply because the oil has become thick with age. Now, when you set the hands on these watches, you push and you engage with this brass wheel here. So if I just put a screwdriver on this slot, that's the winding action. This side, if I push down, we'll see now that the winding crown is engaging with the train there. Now if you can see the cannon pinion there, it's turning when the watch is basically not. So that cannon pinion is turning and I need to remove that. I'll leave that until later. Right. All the wheels, including the balance, are contained under a single bridge, as it were. I'm just going to remove the mainspring barrel first. big screwdriver away and there we go there's the mainspring out typical Roscoff type of mainspring barrel if I separate this into its two halves I just turn backwards and it should unhook in the center there it is now Separating the plates should be relatively easy from now on. One thing I will try and do is unpin the hairspring. Now the hairspring is held in by a taper pin which will push out relatively easily. One thing you can do if you can get a screwdriver behind it and lever it against a pillar then you can often push the use a smaller one there we are you can often push the taper pin out from the back. There it is, it's come out. Don't know where it went. Let's look for that in a minute. So having got the hairspring unpinned, I can now separate the plates. Four screws. At this point I'll zoom in so we can see it a bit more closely. So I pulled the hairspring out and now I'm gonna just separate the plates and zoom out slightly so we can see what's going on underneath. So we've got oopsie one, oops, two, three, four, all the four screws are over here now, there we are. So very, always separate the plates very carefully on a watch. The, the power is off, so there's no, nothing going to come apart. This fits between the plates. This is the push to make winding piece. And there's the spring which operates it, which is riveted to the plate. That's not going to go out. That's not coming out. By the way, there's a number here, 62, that tells us it was made in 1962, which is pretty much as I predicted. Now, at this point, we can separate the plates and the hairspring is caught in the regulator. So there it is. Now if you look at the hairspring, there's a kink at the end which tells us exactly where it was pinned up. So the pin will go in where the kink is just there. I'm going to straighten the kink out slightly because it's a bit too strong. But that's the correct shape, that's how it ought to look. So here we have the train, which has come apart in one piece, which is very nice. We have the third wheel, which 
which is very stiff in its hole. There's a lot of dried oil in there, that's why it wasn't ticking. The pallets, the escape wheel, which is also very stuck in its hole, and the fourth wheel, which has a slightly elongated pivot on the front so for the second hand. So all those wheels were firmly glued in with set and gungy oil, so that's why it wasn't working. Here's the click, there it is, and there's the hole through which we moved it backwards, just there. So that tells you some idea of how we held the click back when we were letting down the mainspring. Right, so that's basically it. One thing we do need to be aware of is that the conical pivots can wear. Now when this watch is clean, we need to peg that cone-shaped hole out, peg it until it's completely clean, re-oil it with a light watch oil, and you should have a fair amount of oil in there, more than you would use on a Inca block watch and the pivots of the balance sometimes wear so you need to look at those and we're going to just bring those up a bit more close hopefully they'll focus I'm quite short let's have a look it's as good as it's going to get so we have to look at the pivots for wear and they should have a fairly sharp point with the extreme tip a polished ball shape but they should be fairly sharp any wear on them and will affect the going of the watch quite badly. If the watch is dropped, the pivots get flats on them and that also needs to be corrected. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put this in the lathe and I'm just going to repolish that top pivot to bring it back to a nice cone shape. Only the extreme tip should be very, very slightly rounded. It shouldn't be needle sharp and it should be sharpish. So there we are, that's the next job clean the whole mechanism, peg out all the holes, give these wheels a clean so that any oil on the pinions is removed. They're all fairly well made. I think the quality is not bad considering this is a cheap pin pallet watch. All the pinions are nicely polished. Very often you'll find on these watches they're run long after they should need a service and the holes in the plate become oval in shape. Yeah. So you might be able to see this hole and that hole are oval in shape. This one's not so bad here, but those two don't look too healthy. These watches have a fairly good tolerance of wear, so hopefully when I've cleaned it and pegged out the holes it will run quite well. I'm just going to remove the cannon pinion, which I didn't do before. I've looked at it and now I know that it comes off in pretty much the same way as most cannon pinions. You bring it up from the front you leave it up very slowly because it will ping off and fly across the room. So there it is. And having removed the little cannon wheel, it's not really a pinion, the whole centre wheel just drops out. There it is. And that, when it's put back, that is a very rigid fit. The whole arbour turns against a friction wheel. So, which is, so there's a friction washer here and one inside there. So the whole of the centre arbour will turn and the pinion and the wheel will remain stationary. So that's how you set the hands. So that has to be driven on very hard and it comes off quite hard as well. The mainspring is coming out of the barrel. To remove the mainspring we lift it up in the centre and then let it out slowly bit by bit. So very gently you're going to just let the mainspring out and under control there we go, just bring the mainspring out bit by bit under control We'll put it back in with the mainspring winder. It's a very strong mainspring, this one. It will fly across the room if you give it half a chance. There it is. There's the mainspring. The whole thing's now ready to go in the cleaning machine. Mm -hmm.